Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at the Navy League's annual Sea Air Space Conference and Trade Show outside Washington, D.C. and National Harbor, Maryland, where our coverage is sponsored by Fincantieri, Huntington Ingalls Industries, and Leonardo DRS. And we're over here at the Office of Naval Research uh, Pavilion. I was going to say enclosure, but it's not really enclosed to uh, talk to Paul Jaffe, uh, who is a uh, Ph.D., uh, who is an uh, electronics engineer. Your Ph.D. is in uh, electrical engineering. Uh, and you're also in the spacecraft uh, electronics engineering, but you've got a much cooler project that you're working on, which is um, a little bit of a holy grail, you know, kind of a small community. We were talking about mutual friends who are involved in it in space power and power beaming. Uh, and, and so um, at the risk of all of us who, of course, love Nikola Tesla and, and stuff like that, talk to us a little bit about space power and power beaming and how actually this incredibly game-changing concept is actually moving toward reality. Yeah, well, so there's no secret that we have today, most of our energy still coming from non-renewable sources, coal, coal, gas, oil, the like. And it is also no secret that it is just a matter of time before those are consumed in their entirety, or at least to the point at which it's economically feasible to recover them. So as a result, we are rightfully looking for sustainable sources, not just for DOD, but for the world at large. One prospective source is the sun, not just the way we collect it now terrestrially, but also in space, because it turns out that sunlight in space is brighter than anywhere on Earth. It is also unaffected by clouds or rain, in fact, in the right orbit, you never go into the shadow of the Earth, or maybe for a very tiny portion of the year, contrast that with the sun going down every day on the Earth. Right. So this idea is not new. It's been looked at over several decades, but there have been very important changes recently that have made it a lot more compelling and urgent that we investigate this carefully. You can look at the way that we are changing how we make satellites. It used to be that satellites were these kind of one-of-a-kind, artisanally crafted creations. Nowadays, we're actually moving to a point where they're almost truly mass-produced, right? It's a commodity where, almost. Exactly, the, and the cost commensurately comes down then. So by reducing the cost of space hardware, we now affect the economics of space solar, this getting sunlight where it's plentiful in space and sending it to where we need it on the Earth. You can look at the work we've done at NRL in developing sunlight to microwave and sunlight to other types of conversion. Uh, you can do power beaming, which is how you get the power from space to the Earth using either microwaves or lasers. We've done a lot of work with that. We have a prototype we've developed that currently holds the world record for conversion efficiency and specific power, which is to say how much power it can generate per unit mass. And then there's also the launch industry revolution that is unfolding before our eyes, where you have companies like SpaceX launching and reusing rockets instead of throwing the whole thing away as we've done for decades. And a huge part of the economics of the craft is that those boosters that would have been jettisoned come back, you rework them, you use them several times at least before you have to do it. Uh, replace them. Precisely. Yeah. So if, that, they, if you don't lose them like you did on the Falcon Heavy, where well, uh, the central booster didn't make it back. Two out of three ain't bad. Two out of three ain't bad. So, uh, so yeah. So these are major influences on the likely economic factors for space solar, which has always been the question. Like it's been recognized even as early as the 60s. That this is definitely technically feasible. There is no violation of the laws of physics or anything. It is merely a question of, do the economics work, and under what circumstances would this make sense? So for remote sites that don't have a lot of infrastructure, it's a lot easier to make that case, even for the early capability, which, like every other energy source, will be more expensive at first. Uh, and a little shout out uh, to uh, a mutual friend of ours, Pete Garretson, a U.S. Air Force officer who's been who's been talking about this for ages uh, as, as, as being uh, uh, an important priority and an important capability. So we've, we've now laid the sort of technological groundwork for feasibility. How would a useful constellation, talk to us about what a useful constellation would be, what it would take, and how much it would cost to implement, and how it would work. Because as you said, power at the edges, if you will, would be a great way to try to use this. Um, on the other hand, you know, it, whatever starts there, given technological trends, tends to mature and accelerate rather rapidly, right? I mean, 10 years ago, Tesla was a joke, whereas now, like, it's, you know, despite, Where's the, mine? <laughs> despite some of the challenges right. the company's having, I mean, it's still very much 
the future in terms of you know usable capability. Indeed. Yeah. So this would unfold and be developed in a kind of uh, progressive fashion, where certainly the power beaming technology has been developed over many years and is experiencing today really rapid progress, but it is definitely not at the level where we're just ready to deploy it, right? So, right. so there's definitely technology component development that is ongoing and that will probably still take at least several years. There's then opportunities now and in the near future to do long distance power beaming demonstrations, possibly from a high altitude craft to the ground, then probably from low earth orbit to the ground. And then for an operational system, you would likely do it in geosynchronous orbit, although a case can be made for other orbits, for low earth orbit constellations. So, but uh, to get to that initial operating capability where someone in the field can actually use this, is going to be probably on the order, I would say, at least 10 years, and all told between the R&D and the production development, uh, undoubtedly in the billions of dollars. So, uh, but this is not unusual. This is similar to what we saw for development of like GPS or even like commercial satellites in the 60s. A lot of similar technologies take a trajectory like this. Or the nuclear attack submarine, or the, exactly. the aircraft exactly. carrier, right? I mean, you, yeah. you've got to make sort of a, a fixed investment if you're going to reap the benefit of it. Indeed. Um, talk to us about the beaming of, of power. Yeah. Just, you are trying to get it through the atmosphere still, mm -hmm. from the spacecraft, down to Earth. Nikola Tesla had some ideas about this. Uh, you know, and talk to us about how you get that power that is collected from a, a large um, uh, lightweight array, which is yep. what you would deploy in order to uh, collect that, uh, which is very feasible. But then talk to us about getting the power because throwing a sort of 18,000 mile extension cord, maybe, yeah. you know, although that's an idea too, right? Some people the have. Space elevator. Space elevator, right? Mm -hmm. But talk to us about how you get that power off the spacecraft and down to the ground. So there's two groups of options. One is in the radio wave or microwave region, where it would be around 2.45 gigahertz or what you use for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, up to uh, maybe about 10 or 12 gigahertz. And then there's other frequencies that might be of interest. And then there's also lasers. So lasers have the advantage in that the size of the transmitter and the size of the receiver can be a lot smaller. The downside is that means you're now at the potential risk of having high power densities that might be dangerous. If you use microwave power transmission, getting to high power densities is really challenging, like almost to the point of being a negligible concern. So, uh, so between microwave and laser, these are the two options. For microwave, you do need a large transmit antenna and a large receiver if you want to get most of the power down. You could make a case for like a emergency response scenario where it's like, ah, you know, it doesn't matter how much it costs, we just need to have X number of megawatts of power because we just had this disaster here. And you could do so like, well, like it's like Puerto Rico. Exactly. You use that kind of power. Exactly, actually. exactly. So in that case, you say like, well, if we throw away half the power there, that's okay, because at least we got the power. And how do you get the power to the plug, right? So talk to us about that chain, because there are a lot of folks who won't be, they'll be like, okay, so wait a minute, he gets yeah. it from the spacecraft to where? So the spacecraft is usually envisioned as having photovoltaics, just solar cells, that converts the sunlight into direct current electricity. If you're using microwave conversion, that would go to a magnetron or some kind of solid state power amplifier that would take that DC power and change it to a microwave frequency for transmission. Right. On the ground, you would receive it with something called a rectenna, a rectifying antenna. Actually, right. I have a, uh, an example of what one of those would look like here. This is just an LED with a Schottky diode, and this one's actually tuned for 2.45 gigahertz, which is the same as uh, Wi-Fi. We'll see if I can get it to uh, light up for you guys here. The point is that you can collect the energy from 2.45 Wi-Fi, same, same frequency. So for lasers, you'd have the same photovoltaics, and you just convert it into laser light. The downside of lasers, and besides the possibility of hazardous power densities, is it won't get through clouds like microwaves will, or through rain. Uh, you could have a high altitude receiver, which we've talked a lot about and done some research and studies of, so that's one way to do it. And that preserves kind of the benefit of having a small receiver on the earth, right. but that still gives you the safety and the portability. And, uh, and then in the end, the interface for the user is just a plug. It's just yep. what you plug yeah, into. Yeah, it's just electricity, straight up electricity. So, so effectively, um, that uh, rectifying 
uh, rectifier would be something along the lines of, you know, for, for a larger network, it would just be your grid power that you yep. plug into, but it would be a box sort of akin to uh, a portable gas generator that, for example, would draw the signal and you would plug it into it. Much like that, yeah. And, and for lasers, it would be like a photovoltaic that is just tuned for the laser wavelength. Right, right, right. And one of the things that often surprises folks is if you have a photovoltaic that is tuned for the laser wavelength, you can get really high efficiencies, like much higher than you would get for a solar photovoltaic. In fact, people have reported in excess of 70% efficient on the laser conversion cells versus uh, even in the, the best ones in the lab for solar are like in the 40s. And if you buy it at Home Depot, it's going to be like 20 if you're lucky. Talk to us a little bit about the hurdles uh, and then talk to us also about the future uh, and how long it'll be before folks are getting powered by solar sun, solar sunlight that's beamed down to their block or to their grid. So major hurdles for microwave power beaming are include spectrum allocation, like there's no kind of free spectrum, so this would have to coexist with what's, already, with what's already there. And people are talking about it, mostly the Japanese have brought this up with the International Telecommunications Union, which generally has jurisdiction over such things, but there's still quite a bit that would have to happen there. Both with laser and microwave or for space solar more broadly, there's likely to be a need to assemble things in space, because these satellites would be larger than your average satellite. And for that, we would need space robotics, which NRL actually, coincidentally, is also making enormous strides in. We're doing uh, RSGS, robotic servicing of geostationary satellites, a publicized DARPA program, which addresses this very problem. So between the regulatory side of spectrum allocation, power beaming technology, in space assembly, space robotics, those are kind of the keys to be addressed right now. Industry is sort of taking care of the launch cost and reusability thing for us on its own, so that's big. In terms of when we would see this, it's really a question of political will, right? Like, we look back at the Apollo moon landing, and that took 10 years or so, less than 10 years. But the reason it happened was because there was the political will to do it, right? They said, we're gonna do this. We're gonna spend the money, we're gonna expend the resources, we're gonna pursue this. Something like that would need to happen to hasten the development of space solar. And that could happen in the US, or honestly, it could happen in a variety of other countries. The Japanese have been looking at this, Chinese, other countries as well, have been pursuing this seriously, and if they get the edge, we could be in another kind of technological surprise situation like we were with Sputnik. Paul Jaffe, PhD, with the Naval Research Lab, who's working on uh, solar, uh, solar power, literally, and, and power beaming from space. Sir, thanks very much, best of luck with the program, and I can't wait for science fiction to happen, because I'm, uh, sick of batteries, and I think it would be a lot better to be operating in a in a uh, a cleaner, literally a cleaner environment. Great, my pleasure.